Morning, everyone. Um, so we're going to finish off this section on drying in today's class. And uh, just a quick comment, if you haven't picked up uh, assignments one, two, three, or four, I have some older ones here as well as midterms, and lots of spare psychometric charts for you to uh, take and practice for the final exam. Um, so just a quick review then of where we, where we are, given that there's been a bit of a break and um, a lot of activity in between. We started the section off, you'll remember, with a, a coverage of a lot of terminology that was very familiar to you. You've seen this in prior courses, but um, we're now just using it again over here. And so I won't go through that again. We spent ample time learning that terminology and how to use the psychrometric chart. Um, humid heat was perhaps a new one that we learned about. This is the heat capacity for um, raising the temperature of a moist stream. And then the other new terminology we learned about was the adiabatic saturation temperature. Um, and it's also the same slope that we derived. Remember the whole uh, idea of the saturation temperature is that these diagonal lines that slope down, um, those are, it's, a, it's a roughly constant number. If you're interested in what it is exactly, it's, it's given to you over there. Um, so given that CS changes by a very small amount, uh, this, this number is roughly constant. So you'll see these lines are mostly parallel. There's a little bit of skew to them. But essentially what it tells us is how we move between our wet bulb temperature given here in green. So our wet bulb temperature is going to be here on this point in the axis. Our dry bulb temperature is there in red. And our driving force is that distance between the two. So we're going to see that coming up in today's class in the derivation. We saw that actually last week already. But we'll see it emphasized here that if you can make that gap wider, you can get a, a greater driving force. And we're interested in a greater driving force so that we can dry our solids at a faster rate. So two ways we said last time, uh, last week, that we can increase that driving force. What are those two ways? So as an engineer, what would you practically go change in the process, Nicole? Decrease the humidity and increase the dry bulb temperature. So you have these two numbers under your control, T and psi. And if you can bring psi down and T up, you're going to bring that red line more over to the left and lower and increase that delta, that driving force. Okay. So we saw that then. And moving on from there, we learned about some, term, uh, some equipment to do this. Uh, we said last time that if we look at our equipment, the key way we can distinguish the dryers are from batch operation versus continuous operation. So a continuous operation, for example, might be um, this sort of uh, dryer here where there's a rotary drum. And the material enters in in the hopper and just continually moves slowly through this dryer and leaves at the end. And it's got a residence time depending on how you set um, the flow rate in. You can also operate it in a batch mode. So a batch mode would be sort of like the idea that you're putting your solids in on this truck, and this truck moves through the dryer and then leaves out at the, at the end. And there was this idea of counter current and co-current um, airflow that could be used depending on the temperature sensitivity. And then lastly, um, the other distinguishing factor that you can use when we're looking at equipment is how you're providing that heat. Are you providing it directly or indi indirectly? And most common, um, we will provide our heat in a direct way. So you're, you're heating your air, putting that in, and you're using that hot air to then um, remove the moisture. And where we ended off with last class was essentially looking at that equation for doing so. We said we're using this hot air to remove moisture. Hot, dry air coming in, and all of that hot, dry air is going to be used to move the moisture off the solid. So if we look at our solid at a, at a sort of a microscopic level, we've got our solid over here with water particles in between. So there's water in these gaps and water on the surface of these particles. And this heat transfer, the heat we're providing, 
comes in and it evaporates that moisture. And so we've got our water flux going the other way. And we derived an equation last class to relate these two, the water flux to the heat flux. It was a very simple equation, uh, deceptively simple. It said the water flux times the heat of evaporation is equal to the heat flux. Now, you'll all, whenever you look at, at unit operations in chemical engineering that have both heat and mass transfer, right, we're, it's not that those, if you've got heat transfer happening, it's, unless it's just a pure heat exchanger where you're just exchanging heat between two streams, the reason why you have heat moving around is to do something useful. And well, what is the useful activity in this particular case is to drive off the moisture from the surface. But if you look at any other unit operation like evaporators, for example, there again the heat flux is being used to do something useful. So, um, so here we're using our heat flux to drive moisture off. And just to quick uh, comment on, on the units and the notation here, we derived the water flux last time here. I'll just put in the numbers. 1 over A times dmw by dt. So that's my water flux. Let's just take a look at uh, the units there to make sure that they work for us. Well, dmw is mass of water evaporated. Mass of water evaporated out of the solid. So change in water evaporated, kilograms water evaporated. DT has got units of time, and then area has those units. So there's, there's a flux. We see the units of flux, mass per unit time per unit area. Delta H VAP has units of joules per kilogram water. So that's how much energy do you need to provide per kilogram of water to transfer the, uh, convert the water from the liquid phase to the vapor phase? And then what we re end up with then are what we would expect for heat flux units of joules per meter squared seconds. Okay. And a bit of our discussion last class was um, about that heat flux. We said, well, a heat flux, or any flux for that matter, is equal to driving force over resistance. Okay, so driving force over resistance. I'll just move that down here. Our driving force for heat flux, we've, we've just re recapped it there a second ago, is equal to the delta temperature between the dry bulb and the wet bulb. So that's my driving force. And the greater you can make that, the greater you can get a heat flux. And because this heat is being used to drive mass, by extension, if you get a larger temperature difference, you'll evaporate your water faster, a faster water flux. Okay, so, so that's desirable. What is our resistance? Well, this is the topic of today's class. The resistance we said last time was 1 over H, 1 over the heat transfer coefficient. So a heat transfer coefficient, well, that's the resistance. Would you, let's just, under, let's, where we're heading with this is understanding how we, what quantity this number has, whether we would like it to be big or small. So a resistance then, would you like your resistance to be large or small? Maybe let me back up that question a little bit. In heat transfer, what is your resistance? Right, what is the thing that is resisting the heat being transferred or slowing down or delaying your heat being transferred? Think back a little bit to 3A. Think back what is happening here right at that molecular level. What is delaying or slowing down heat being transferred?
Maybe discuss it with yourselves. There's a lot of blank faces here. I'm going to need the answer from you first. The medium that you're transferring heat through, what about that medium? Okay, what it's, what it's made of, what it's consisting of. Okay, in this case, what is the medium that we're transferring heat through? So let's maybe re redraw that picture. We've got some sort of dry solid here water in these gaps, water on the surface of the solid, heat coming towards us. What is the resistance in this, in this case for that heat being transferred to where it's going? And by, my next question is going to be, how can you make that resistance smaller or bigger? Suggestions? No? Uh, if, you the if you increase the velocity of the air, what would. Okay, your expectation is, your gut feel right now is if you increase the velocity of the air, it's going to make the resistance smaller. Does that seem plausible? Okay, so if that statement is plausible, what is your resistance? If velocity is affecting the resistance, what is that resistance? Can, how, could, how would you describe it to someone? Nicole? Diffusion through the air around this region here. Okay? So there's some sort of diffusion of that moisture back out into the bulk. You have to drive that water vapor. Once it's evaporated, so it moves from, from liquid to vapor, you have to get it away from there to get more moisture moving. Okay, so that heat flux is being limited by the diffusion through the, the boundary layer thickness around that. And so by increasing the velocity of the air, you would expect a lower resistance. So clearly we'd like a lower resistance. If you want a lower resistance, do you want a higher H or a smaller H? Numerically? Larger, okay? So H should go up. Okay, so you expect that when we derive equations for H, that increasing the velocity should increase H. If you don't see that, then you know that you've screwed up. Okay? Or you've got, got something, something's messed up. So I don't want to, like these equations are mindless, right? They're trivial. They're like anyone from grade 12 can use these sorts of equations. But where you've got to use them is with your head and figure this stuff out. Right? And the fact that you don't know what resistance is, that's, that's a warning sign. Right? At least no one's verbalized what the resistance is quickly. So make sure that you understand what's, what's your driving force, what's your resistance. Whenever you're moving mass around, whenever you're moving heat around, you've got to be able to quantify what exactly these two are. Okay, so we, um, we then derived an equation last class, and let's see if it matches with this understanding that we've just developed over here. The equation we derived last class was um, a little bit, it looks messy, but it's really simple. Um, here's our starting point that we have up on the board. Our mass flux multiplied by the heat of vaporization is our driving force over resistance. And when we look at that derivative equation there, we can integrate it. We recognize that everything, we had this discussion last class, everything over here on the right is constant. And so when we integrate it, it shows up in a really nice way. But let me um, perhaps do the integral in a little bit of an unconventional way. Here I'm going to write this equation um, this way and heat flux we said is T dry bulb minus T wet bulb over 1 over H. Okay, so another way you can end up at exactly the same point as that last line over there on the slide is to simply recognize that given that all those constants, uh, sorry, all these variables are constant, 
you can go and replace this equation as follows. 1 over A is equal to the change in water over the change in time to evaporate that water. Okay, so let me perhaps be a bit more explicit over there. Delta MW over delta T, that's the amount of water removed And delta T is the time to remove that amount of water. Okay, so simply discretizing the derivative here. Multiplied by delta H VAP, we can bring that 1 over H from the denominator up to the numerator and write it as H dry bulb minus wet bulb. Okay. And then once you have the equation in that form, you can just simply rearrange it for this delta T over there on the right, and everything else falls out on the left. Okay, so it's a fairly straightforward interpretation of that same idea. And we ended off the class on Friday, in fact, by illustrating that this all makes great sense, that if you want to spend less time to remove that mass of water, well, you can do several things. You can just use less water to start off with. You can, can't change delta H VAP, that's fixed. You can use a higher heat transfer coefficient. So higher heat transfer coefficient, less resistance, your time to remove the water decreases. You can increase the surface area of your solid. Right? We, this is an intuitive one. If you've got more surface area, there's more um, surface area for the water to leave. And then again, if you increase your driving force, you get less time. So, so that, that all matches our expectation. The only thing that we haven't solved yet is what is H? Well, let's take a look at H now. H is your heat transfer coefficient. And it has um, units of watts per meter squared Kelvin. And H you always get from correlations. So here on the next slide, we have some of them. Here's two correlations given to you, one for parallel flow and one for perpendicular flow. So if your solids are in that configuration and you're flowing parallel to it with a certain velocity V, some sort of average velocity parallel to the surface you're drying, then there's a correlation that says H is equal to zero point, where's it gone? Uh, 0 0.0204 times G to the 0 0.8, okay? Now, whenever you got correlations, that's immediately a warning sign that things are not going to be quite as simple as using SI units. Correlations, for some reason, always like to use awkward units. And here, in this case, the correlation calls for G to have units of kilograms per hour per meter squared. Well, let's, take, let's just step back what G is. G is equal to rho times the average velocity. Rho is the density of the air, so kilograms per meter cubed. And the average velocity is meters per second. Okay, and then there's that 3,600 factor up at the front to make sure you get your G in the units required. So they want units of per hour. Okay, so that's all that G is. G is, if you try to interpret that in English to someone, is the amount of air you need per cross-sectional area per unit time. This is the how much air you're going to have to blow through your dryer for a given cross-sectional area in your dryer. Kilograms per hour of air required per meter squared. So this correlation tells you that if you're sending this much air in per unit time, per unit area, you can derive a heat transfer coefficient, H. Okay? As long as you obey this constraint that your G value lies between that lower and upper bound. And that's, always, that's typical for correlations. They're valid in a certain range. Does it match our expectation that if velocity goes up, we get a higher heat transfer coefficient? Yes, no? Yes, to some extent, there's a, a velocity term embedded there in G. 
There's your velocity term. So velocity to the power of 0.8 um, is your increase in h. Okay, so let me give you an opportunity to try using this equation. Calculate h for the following case. So what is h for a velocity of, um, let's use 3 meters per second. So quickly give that a try. Make sure that you can use that. And then if you're finished calculating that, calculate the, velocity, the h for um, perpendicular flow. So this is the h for parallel flow. Sorry? Um, so you just, you just change the angle of it down uh, and we're by calculating these two numbers you're going to see what it does yeah. anyone got an H value for parallel flow what number? Yeah. Around, Nick? 35. around 35 okay so let's just see how we get that H 0 0.0204 G to the point eight. G is 3,600 times the density. What's the density of air? Moist air. No. 1.05, roughly one if you've got no other judgment, times three to the power 0 0.8. Okay. If you want a more accurate estimate of the density, Go back a few slides, there's the equation for it right there um, here on, related to humid heat. Uh, sorry, humid volume I should say. So humid volume is the inverse density of moist air. So you can go calculate the humid volume. So this should be your more accurate way of doing this is calculate the humid volume first. You need two numbers, psi and the dry bulb temperature. Once you have that, invert that number and then that's the equivalent of density. Okay? If you're stuck, a value of around 1 is good enough. But if you're working accurately, you'd like to do that substitution in there. So let's just work um, with this rough value of 1. And then if you sub in all those values you solve, you'll get a, humid, uh, a heat transfer coefficient of about 34 in this case. So 34 units of watts per meter squared Kelvin. What is your expectation if you move that air stream rather than coming in parallel, what if you moved your air to blow perpendicularly to your solids? What is your expectation of the heat transfer coefficient? Given your new understanding that it's related to resistance, You can go ahead and calculate the number, but prior to you finishing that up, how should H perpendicular compare to this instance over there? No guesses? The same, higher, lower? Higher? Because? One over H gets lower, but why should the perpendicular heat transfer coefficient be higher than the parallel heat transfer coefficient? You get a little bit more turbulence at that surface, remembering the whole idea that resistance is related to that boundary layer over there. So if you're impinging heart perpendicular, you should be thinning out that boundary layer, decreasing resistance, H should go up. 
Does it go up? How much does it go up by? Minimally. So what is your answer over here? Okay, so remember in a practical piece of equipment, you'd have to go reorient your velocity source to be parallel, sorry, perpendicular to the surface. That might cost you a significant amount of money to do that, but your gain here is fairly minimal. 36 versus 34, you didn't gain a whole lot. Didn't we say it in the field of resistance is based on like the, the moisture layer and then the moisture vapor that forms above it? Yeah. So I guess my opinion was I thought the parallel flow would be better because if you have perpendicular flow, it like becomes turbulent and raises those beds, but it doesn't really sweep it away just kind of comes up and it's going to be floating there still all of a sudden like right. larger dispersed clouds. Right. Away. That's a good, good point. So if you're flowing parallel, yes, you get that sweep away, but you don't get that thin boundary layer. Your boundary layer in that case might be a little thicker. Right? So coming down perpendicularly, yeah, you thin out your boundary layer, but you're not moving that moisture away as rapidly. So your, your gain is fairly minimal. Okay. So you can have all sorts of, uh, and try using this equation at low velocity. So I've used three meters per second. It might be that at three meters per second, it really doesn't matter anymore whether you're flowing parallel or perpendicular. But I, I challenge you to try this at low velocities and see what your relative change looks like. Okay, so, so far, um, we're, we're actually now pretty much in a good position. If we look back at this equation, we've got all our numbers here to start working. We know our mass of moisture that we're going to have to remove heat of vaporization, temperature differences, area, and H. So let's go try it out in an in a exercise. But before we get to that, there's one small piece of theory we do have to cover, and that's terminology related to dry basis and wet basis. And this might be a little bit weird at first, but when we use... Uh, when we work in the area of drying, both of these are used. The dry basis is used a little bit more frequently than wet basis, but it's very simple. The wet basis is simply defined, let's compare them side by side here. A wet basis is simply defined as your mass of water in your solids given the mass of wet solids. So this one's appealing because you can measure your mass of wet solids very easily. You can go dry them off and you can go calculate how much moisture was in there. So it's very, very simple to get that quantity. Your dry basis, on the other hand, is defined as the same numerator, but the denominator is mass of dry solids. Okay, so that equation isn't new. It's given to you up there in orange with every single one of those two entries. But let's um, perhaps just put a little bit of, of variable names here. So let's call x my mass of water. Let me call y my mass of wet solids. OK, so given that terminology, your wet basis is simply x over y. It's straightforward. Your dry basis, though, would be given as x over y minus x. Okay, so you can always calculate one given the other. And in the slide over here is an example given for you. You can go work through that. But I'll, uh, I'll perhaps just throw a slightly different example for you to just go double check your understanding. This example says if you've got if you have 40% moisture on the dry basis for 100 kilograms of dry solids okay if that's the case, how much of that, um, if you've got 100 kilograms of dry solids, you can write the following equation. 
your dry basis is 0.4. 40% moisture on a dry basis, 0.4, is equal to mass of water over mass of dry solids. Well, mass of water over mass of dry solids, I've got 100 kilograms of dry solids. So that implies my mass of water is 40 kilograms. That's simple stuff, right? Now what is, for that system, what is the equivalent moisture percentage expressed on a wet basis? So take a minute to calculate that. So if I say 40% moisture on a dry basis, what is the equivalent moisture on a wet basis? Any answers? For the um, wet basis, we do your 40 percent of the water over 40 percent of the water plus the 100 percent of the water. OK, so it's very simple. 40 kilograms of water, and if you've got 100 kilograms of dry, oh, 100 kilograms of dry solids and 40 kilograms of water, it's 40 over 140, you get on a dry, on a wet basis, that's 28.6%. Just subbing into that equation over there. Okay, so, yeah. Over here. No, mass of wet solids minus X. So take your wet solids, remove the moisture, you get dry solids. Mass of water over mass of dry solids. Okay. okay, so just, uh, yes. We started with 100 kilograms of dry solids. Okay, so if I have 100 kilograms of dry solids and I say to you, if I've got 40% moisture, and for a given amount of material, there's 100 kilograms of dry solids, there'll be 40 kilograms of water, so there's 140 kilograms of wet solids. I thought that 100 was dry. Yeah, right. It is dry. So if you take, if you took 140 kilograms, 40 of that is water, and 100 kilograms is dry. Okay. So it's, it's just, a, it's, you pick a basis and you work with it. Your basis might be the dry solids, your basis might be the wet solids. And that's what the, those two alternatives do. They take a mass of water and your basis in the first instance is the mass of wet solids. In the second instance, your mass is the dry solids. Okay, so it's, it's a little confusing, but all it is is a mass balance. There's either water or there's solids. And so what we'll typically find is using, perhaps you might consider it this one more confusing as uh, was just suggested here. Why do you pick your basis of dry solids? Well, this is what's typically used. Most, more commonly we'll see the dry basis being used and not the wet basis for whatever reason that is. Okay, so just be, be aware of it and be able to interchange between the two. So let's, let's try bringing all these threads together now. We've got a few minutes left to finish off this example. And this example um, uses the idea of a plate and frame filter press. So we've seen these guys before. Um, in, in an earlier section, you've got your plate and frame filter press. Here we've got a long, uh, a long device. And each one of these plates has solid building up in it. And by the end of that cycle, 
this blue frame here right closest to you opens up and those plates separate. Operators come in with knives and they scrape off those solids and they essentially look like sheets of drywall and they fall down to the bottom. So that's why this is built on a higher level. You see they through the grate. It drops down a level down and then those solids now um, still have moisture embedded in them and they need to be dried out. So you've got these sheets of solid. 100 kilograms, let's consider 100 kilograms as our basis in this instance. It's discharged at 30% moisture and I'm going to use a wet basis just to give you a bit of practice. You're going to take those sheets and dry them using 75 degree air at 10% humidity, a velocity of 4 meters per second parallel to the solid surface in a tray dryer. Let's take a look at that quick. So there's a tray dryer. Every one of these trays holds a sheet and let's give an area to that, an area of two meters squared. Okay, so we're going to put in our, our heat through this heater, electric heat provided perhaps here, and we're moving that air around. And so that air impinges on the solid in a parallel direction. Okay, so we're considering 100 kilograms of cake. It's wet cake here, 30% moisture, 10% humidity. Air is being used. The tray holds two meters squared. How long does it take to achieve 15% on a dry basis? Okay, so estimate the drying time. I'm going to give you a few minutes to write out what you know and what you don't know. And then so basically you're just going to plan your strategy. I don't expect you to do any calculations. I just want you to plan your approach here. So I'll give you two, three minutes. Work with someone next to you to do this. This is a similar question to the one that's in the assignment. Remember in the explore step, you would record what you know and what's unknown. Okay, so that can be a fairly substantial list in this particular problem.
Okay, so how are we going to go about this? What, what do we know? What don't we know? What are we going to look for? Let's hear some suggestions. Okay, so dry bulb is given. Okay, do we need the humidity? Okay, we've got 10% humidity, so you can read off the corresponding humidity and then get your wet bulb temperature. So get your wet bulb from the psychrometric chart. What else do we need? I'll give you one. We've got area, two meters squared. Anything else? We're going to need a heat transfer coefficient, H. To get H, okay, so you're going to need the density. And we're given the velocity of, was it four meters per second? Yeah. Okay, so we're going to get H from a correlation. We're going to get rho from a calculation. Yes? So it's parallel to the solids. So when we go look up our correlation, we're going to pick the right one. Anything else that we need, Nicole? Okay, we're, we're going to have to calculate that from our dry basis and our wet basis. How much moisture are we removing here? Anything else that we need? Yes. Okay, we're going to need delta H VAP. And that's going to be from an from interpolating between our given values of 0 and 100 degrees. We've got the data at 0 and 100. We're going to have to find delta H VAP at which temperature? At the wet bulb temperature. Heat of vaporization takes place at the wet bulb. So that's another reason why we need the wet bulb temperature here. Not only to calculate the driving force, but also to go calculate the heat of vaporization at that wet bulb temperature. Okay. So we've got all of this um, ideas going here, but it's all playing into our plan, which we haven't really explicitly said. Um, our plan is going to be to use the equation that delta T is delta MW heat of vaporization over the area times our heat transfer coefficient and then dry bulb minus wet bulb. So that's our goal is to use that equation. We seem to have an idea of how to go about getting all those numbers now. Um, there is one important step though. Is this equation valid? Rachel? We want to make sure or at least assume that all of these are constant. Now there's a number of assumptions here. So we're assuming constant rate evaporation. Okay, that, that has to be clear. Right? We can't just uh, use that equation without that assumption. We have to assume that all our properties are in fact constant. In particular, the most problematic one, which might often not be that true, is that area. The material that shrinks as it dries will have a changing area. So we have to be certain of that fact. Things like dry bulb temperature, you, you have that under your control. You can keep that constant. But um, the other properties we should, in fact, double check. OK, and you're also assuming that all your heat goes to, goes to vaporizing salt of the liquid. So you're not having heat losses to heat up the solids. That in fact, that heat is being 
used for something useful. Okay, so, so we've got that idea. And then um, I'll just show, there's the numbers for you. You can fill those in um, for yourself. You can go ahead and calculate all those answers. Um, again, we've, we've done exercises on all of these before. None of this is new. The only part that is new for you is subbing this all in and calculating a drying time. But everything else we've done before several times in the class, particularly on Friday, we had a, a lot of opportunity to calculate those dry bulb and wet bulb temperatures and so forth. The only one I do want to talk a bit about is um, let's just quickly work together and calculate that mass of water removed. The mass of water removed is probably one that requires a little bit more clarification. We said we're starting at 0 0.3 on a wet basis. And a wet basis, remember, says, let's just call that mass of water at the start. The wet basis is mass of water over mass of wet solids. So we've got mass of water at the start over 100 kilograms of wet solids. So that gives me my starting moisture is 30 kilograms. That's straightforward. Well, how much moisture are we going to um, end up with? Well, we're asked to get to an end point of 15%, 0.15, but on a dry basis. Okay, well, on a dry basis, let's call this um, mass of water at the end over mass of dry solids. Well, how much dry solids did I have? Let's take a look here. We actually can figure that out. If at the beginning I have 100 kilograms of wet solids, of which 30 kilograms is water, that implies that my mass of dry solid is equal to 70 kilograms. Okay. So we're told we've got 100 kilograms of wet solids, 30% on the wet basis. So that implies we've got 30 kilograms of water. By difference, then we must have 70 kilograms of dry solids. At the end, we need to end up with 0.15 on a dry basis. The dry basis definition is mass of moisture over mass of dry solids. So that implies that the mass of water at the end is equal to the 10.5 um, kilograms, which then implies that the mass of water that you've evaporated is the difference there. We started off with 30 kilograms of water. We end off with 10.5. So 19.5 kilograms of water is going to be evaporated. Okay, heat of vaporization we get from an interpolation. A, we know we're given. H, we can calculate the dry bulb and the wet bulb temperature we can calculate. And so we're set. Okay. Just a quick sanity check. Is that heat transfer coefficient reasonable? 41.7? ballpark to the one that we calculated earlier. So uh, this case, we're using a slightly higher velocity. So that, that's consistent. So this drying time isn't totally unreasonable. So here's the one question I'll leave you with is, how can we dry these solids faster? Well, one way is to flow our air perpendicular. But a far better way is to perhaps reform, if possible, our solids into spherical pellets and dry it in a packed bed. So I'll give you an opportunity to use these heat transfer coefficients there and just see how really that impacts your drying time. Okay, I'll recap that in Wednesday's class at the beginning, but most of tomorrow's class will in fact just be a summary of the whole semester's worth of work. Okay, so I'll see you tomorrow then.